Man, that was amazing. A great conversation with a great filmmaker. One of my favorite amazing. YouTubers out there. Filmmakers, I would say. Yeah, that's what YouTuber I, is a too common word for this yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had uh, Daim Khalid yeah. on the podcast, and we talked to him about filmmaking, storytelling, Pakistan, Canada, immigration, like so many different things. Marrying outside of your culture. Yeah, that was a big one at the end. And yeah. I'm glad I asked that question because I was hesitant to ask it. Mm-hmm. And his answer just, just floored me. It was absolutely beautiful. And um, yeah, I hope you guys love it. I hope you guys love it. We had it. a beautiful conversation. Check us out on YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple Music, Apple Podcasts, or whatever yeah, you get your podcast yeah, for from. Sure. And uh, hear it out, like this, subscribe this, do whatever you want with it. But See definitely check again. this whole thing out. You will definitely love it. I talked to you on Clubhouse the other day, and I was so excited to have you on the podcast just for that, because we had that like 10 minute conversation. Bro, that will make no sense to me at all. I don't know why you'd be excited to have me on there, because you've had some pretty pretty crazy people on this. It was just like, we, like, I know we would have hit it off anyways, but when we were on Clubhouse just talking (laughs) about Passenger, John Mayer, poetry, writing. (laughs) It was just like, bro, yeah, what man. are you doing in Beirut? You should be right here in Toronto. Bro, no, man, I I, mean, I am in Toronto. I'm just in Beirut for, for a limited time. But yeah, man, yeah. like, I, I feel like we, we really jam on that music. But I think for with me, it was like, you, you told me that you were, you shared my uh, my work with some people. So yeah. to me, like, it really means a lot that, that, you know, somebody that doesn't really know me personally would share something, you know, even as, as simple as sending a link to somebody, it's just like, yeah. you know, this person really cares about somebody's growth, um, whether it's for me sure. or some an, sure. another upcoming artist, you know. Yeah. Dude, we watch your videos on the home TV downstairs with our parents. <laughs> Uh, that's the way to do it you know i'm, I'm kind of like picky like I, I put a lot of work into the the detail of that stuff so it, it yeah. really makes me happy when people tell me they're watching it on actual tvs instead yeah, of just on their phones yeah, I, I watch your videos on my laptop as well and i always bump it up to 4k because that's yeah. how you're intending to watch it right that's how it is man. and and when i watched it with my parents like i watched a couple of videos with them last night as well just to prep for this i was like right, Amma, right. but you got to watch this like you, you actually have to watch this like this yeah, is yeah, just yeah. um the most purest simplest frame that you'll you'll see but the message and the entire packaging of it is so sincere that like anyone with the soul will be moved and I'm, that's, that's exactly so what happened that's and so the thing you were talking about uh sharing it with other people i shared it with Irfan Bhai, and i was I, it's very daunting to share anything with him because he's like pakistan's biggest youtuber or whatever yeah so i was yeah. like okay wait this he has to see this Mashallah. he has to check out yeah yeah loved i, I mean loved it, man. I mean, like, I think right after that, he like gave me a follow on Instagram. So I like saw it. I'm like, hey, I know this guy. I've heard of him through like, you know, social media and stuff. So like, oh, I guess this stuff is getting out there. Yep. But yeah, like, uh, it turns out it was you who sent it. So I was like, oh, awesome. I've got some like sort of connection. And now I can talk to these people because I, I always felt like a little bit disconnected from the Pakistani creative community, yeah. despite having, you know, despite being born and having grown up there. Um, I, I always felt like every time I went there, I just didn't know the right people, yeah. um, to be able to, you know, just hang out with them, not to really yeah. even create anything, just to be able to say, Hey, like, it's really good to connect as creatives, just to sort of you know, hammer out funny, some ideas that's, together. That's, that's exactly how I felt when I w- was trying to be a creative here until I met right. your brother on yeah. a YYZ creators photo walk. Right. Yeah. And I yeah, met yeah. him and it was like an instant connection. Like he was helping me out with my ISO. He was like, no, no, don't right. shoot with this yeah, lens. Yeah. It was just those basic steps that I was like, okay, this is, I feel a connection. I'm going to yeah. pursue this. And then my brother's the way years. cooler than me, man. That guy is one of my inspirations. He's younger than me, but I, I hold him to, to that level. You know, like I really yeah. admire him a lot. I was on those, He's a couple of those photo well. walks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> are you, are you younger? Bashan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. yeah. He just looks older. He's like six foot and I'm like five ten. And oh, like, he's okay. older, he's bigger, but like, I'm the older one. Well, in I, terms I, of wisdom, he's definitely up there. <laughs> oh, I got you. Got you. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess that's the one thing that we have going for us. You know, the older ones, Absolutely. the experience <laughs> teaches a lot. <laughs> so he's like, you know what? You don't have to learn this yourself. I'll just tell you what this <laughs> And they never listen. <laughs> how, how much older are you from Osama? Um, just two years from Osama. And then I have a youngest brother. We have another one. Okay. Uh, and I'm five years older than him. So, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm a couple of years older than him too. So, and then mm. it just stops here. <laughs> mm. I think that's the perfect like gap to have between brothers because you're not too old <laughs> to like not have a, an honest conversation. Like yeah, that. honestly, um, it's like uh, you know, if, from Shazel, the youngest brother. I do yeah. feel like we have sort of a uh, not a disconnect, but like there is there are oh, there is an overlap, um, but there yeah. are a lot of things that we admire differently or we appreciate differently. But with me and Osama, like it's it's like culturally at least we we jam on a lot of stuff whether yeah. it's music whether it's art movies um it's it's always like a good time um with my youngest brother like we have to connect on different things like games or something else yeah, yeah. um but yeah i guess the culture you know varies time to time so that five-year gap is a bit much for that level of connection maybe but yeah. uh you know me and osama i think when we were uh after we came to canada like just consuming all the new content and all the new uh new media and art um a lot of it was like sort of passed down from me to him and then a lot of it like he introduced me to so yeah. it's just always an exchange yeah yeah that hasan minad said that like your younger siblings like their entire personality is based on their older siblings and, and you know what i'm not I'm, i will neither confirm nor deny that because <laughs> you know, okay, i don't know as a younger sibling myself i think i can confirm that you know a lot of the music taste a lot of the movie yeah, taste yeah, they yeah. are they do pass on from my older yeah, sibling, yeah. so for sure, for right. sure. i mean he's on record to say that now so he can't come back from that there it is there it is okay i'll tell us someone be like yo like. <laughs> so um you were talking about your like initial journey of like uh you know connecting with film and art with your younger brother um right. when did you move from pakistan and how did you find film uh i mean i was 10 uh, it was 2004 august august 6th actually and i know the exact date i remember it like crisp like perfect um yeah, we moved in August and it was just before the school year. I had to enroll myself in elementary school and do grade yeah. five all over again. I'd done it in yeah. Pakistan and I had to do it again because I entered school a bit early. Um, but yeah, that transition. Like, was was it a sad departure from Pakistan? Uh, like when you were coming here, like what does a 10 year old know about coming to Canada and what to expect? You know, you know, I was 10. So like at the time, you know, it's that, it's that point in your life where it's like everything's full of wonder and you're just exploring, like life's all about going out after school and having, you know, playing street cricket or going to the yeah. arcade or, you know, eating faluda off a cart right across the street <laughs> um, when your dad's at work because he doesn't allow you to do those yeah, things. For sure. um, but um, yeah, like uh, it was really as like the most I can remember about us preparing to leave is like, my parents having conversations about things that we weren't really tuning into, but always in the background. And then one day just seeing like my mom packing stuff in bags. And then yeah. I was like, where are we going? And she's like, Oh, we're going abroad. We're going to Canada. Bye to Like it was always yeah, like, yeah. we're going outside, you know? <laughs> um, and my uncle was already in Canada at the time. So I had an idea of like where we're going. I just didn't know like what Canada was even at the time. Like, yeah. I don't know what it was as a country, where it was. Uh, how similar it was to America, which is, which America, everyone knows. You yeah, know? <laughs> that's true. Uh, in popular culture, it's always there. But Canada, I didn't really know anything about. But I don't think I was emotionally, you know, affected as much as I would have been if I was older, I think. Um, yeah. I wasn't really, you know, I enjoyed my childhood a lot. It was an incredible childhood. Um, but um I don't think I was emotionally attached to things yet. I think I hadn't developed that sort of attachment yeah. to many things. But I, I'm always also the type of person, and I think this has remained true since I was a kid, that, that I'm always looking to explore new things and new places. And, you know, and that sort of excited me. Getting on a plane, you know, who doesn't get excited by that thought? For sure, for sure. And then how did you find film? Like, was it immediate? Was it gradual? Was it... <clears throat> like you know in those initial years because like for us yeah. when we moved i was a lot older i was about i was about 16 and he was 14 and like i was in the middle of o levels so which is like the like grade 11 right and i came here yeah, in grade 11 yeah. and it's just a complete disparity and that's where i found like writing and books right yeah. and then yeah. that was my avenue and now i'm here <laughs> because of that so was it somewhere like because when you move you it's just a departure from your old life that mm -hmm. you sort of have to fill it with something else would yeah, usually yeah, hopefully yeah. it's passions and not you know recreational drugs <laughs> as yeah. every mom is worried about but exactly how did yeah. you find it um for me i think um 
I, I, as far as back as I can remember, I was always the, like the visual art kid, you know, yeah. um, even in Pakistan, the things that interested me most were related to like visual art, whether it was just watching TV or playing games or, um, you know, drawing and sketching. Yeah. Um, and I think that's sort of what led me to start picking up the camera and just taking photos. So it started with photography actually. Yeah. Um, and we came to Canada, I think a few years later, I just, I had one of those Canon power shot point shoots yeah. and uh, my friends and I were just goofing around. This was the time when like just rain and, and, uh, what's his name? Uh, AK, the, yeah. these two guys are doing it in the Canadian, you know, YouTube Struggle, scene. Yeah. And, uh, we were like, yo, let's make, let's make videos about Brown people too. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's do the accent and stuff. So we started just fooling around. It was really like kind of pointless. Um, but at the same time, like it helped me learn what editing is like and, and you know, how to tell a story, even if it's just you inside a house with nothing to do, like, yeah. you know, what can you do with that and how you can use the imagination or bits and pieces of your culture to create something. And um, yeah, from there, like I, I sort of let it drop after a while because, you know, school sort of started taking more of my time and um, I, I delved back into photography. Um, yeah, I used to just take pictures for fun. I wasn't really earning money with it or anything like that. Yeah. It was just a sort of a side hobby. But, you know, at the time I would just sketch things or paint things here and there. Um, Even and, if photography is really like, it has a story to it too. And like Peter McKinnon says that every photo should tell a story. Like that's the purpose of that. And same thing with every frame of your videos, they tell a different story. And that's the beauty of what you do. It's, it's so un, not unusual, but unique yeah. from what everybody else is doing. Thanks, man. Um, I, I think I'd go on to say that like every piece of art should tell a story. Yeah. Um, st I think beyond anything material, stories are the true currency of the world. And yeah. I, I, I really sort of yearn to see a glimpse of the days when people were just like walking for six months just to go over to the next like town yeah. um, and and the way news spread or you know culture spread was through people being like yeah i've been there let's talk about this place please tell me more about this place you know ibn cena and like all these dudes yeah. um and that like just like really really makes me curious as to like the, the like there there's probably like people sitting in a circle and just absorbing information about a new place and i feel like that's the way society really like advanced um culturally at the very, at the very yeah. least um but yeah for me like the element of storytelling is like probably it's the the most vital part um yeah pretty much everything and, i put out there and like i think uh, i was listening to a yarn martel interview uh, where he was talking about like how we're storytelling animals and how most of religion is passed down through storytelling. Yeah. Like the things that we remember about Islam and, and, and the wondrous, like even the story of Miraj, it's just, it's so powerful because of the story of itself, like of what happened. And then yeah. you tell it to your kids and they're moved. And then even the Quran has yeah. a multitude of stories yeah. that captivate us. Yeah. And that's exactly, exactly. You hit it on the head with, um, because every, every art has to tell a story. And I feel like you do it so brilliantly. Um, when did you find your style? Because you're such a unique style. I haven't seen it replicated or it doesn't seem like it's copied from anyone else. It's simple. The framing is simple, but there's such sincerity, as I said before, like there's, it's truth to it, all of it. And you know, it's, it's, it's actually, it's really funny you say that. Thank you, first of all, but it's really, because I feel like I still, I'm still like scrambling to find a style. <laughs> and it's, it's really just, I think it's just through a lot of um, like absorption combined with experimentation, right? Yeah. Um, for me, it's just watching a lot of movies that, that really, I, I, I always just try to watch at least one or two movies per week. Yeah. Uh, back when I was younger, it was like five movies per week, I would say. Yeah. Uh, my brother and I, when, you know, before COVID and everything, every Tuesday, we'd go to the theater and just, you know, see something in the cinema. Yeah, because uh, it was half off, or, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tuesdays are the days, man. Yep. That's the day. Love them. And the theater is empty. Nobody goes. So it's yep, just like yep. this perfect opportunity. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like for me, it's like absorption because... A lot of my work, you can even trace it, trace the inspirations a little bit. Like you can see a lot of um, Studio Ghibli films. Like yeah. if you've ever watched Spirited Away and that's their, 
I think those are the the films that really prompted me to make nature a character in my work, you know, as opposed to just landscape and beautiful shots about yeah. something. It's almost like nature imposes itself as a presence that influences the people that are, that are part of this story. So like that for me is one of the, the big things, you know, I, I love color and I really observe color in, in movies like say Dunkirk or um, Fight Club and that, that kind of yeah. stuff. And, and that really inspires me to tell a story through color. And yeah. it's just a lot of different experimentation because, you know, it goes back to the idea that nothing's really original. Like if you see a new style, it's really just an amalgamation of different things that person yeah. has experienced or absorbed and they borrowed. So it's, it's basically the same thing with me is that I watch a lot of movies and find a lot of things that I'm inspired by and then see what I can uh, sort of copy and then, you know, evolve further with my own style. The thing that's really uh, cool about your style of shooting is that most of the time the camera is stagnant and the subject is moving as opposed to it being the other way where the camera camera follows the subject that like just that, <clears throat> that juxtaposition of everything makes right, right, right. the scene so much more like, uh, like interactive. You're just like, mm. cause, cause the camera isn't moving. So you're the yeah, viewer yeah. is stationary, but the subject is doing something like you're playing guitar or you're singing or you're walking with your brother up or down a hill. Like it's just, it, it moves me, man. I don't know what it is. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> it's, um, there's just something about seeing somebody in the stillness of the camera while they're moving. Yeah. And then, I think what you said in one of your uh, videos was that you're just watching people go about doing their everyday life things. Um, and that's what I kind of felt when I was watching all of your videos when you were, went up to the mountains. I mean, for me, it was like watching their lives. And I think you said this as well, where these people, they're born here, they're going to live here, they're going to die here. So it was just something about their lives that maybe kind of reflect back on mine. Yeah. It was weird nostalgia, bro. Yeah. It was that's what I felt. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, it's interesting you use that word stillness. Um, and that technique, um, for me, there's like there's multiple reasons I I do that. Is that you know, the theoretical reason being that uh, it's like Miyazaki said, it's the concept of ma. Um, it's, it's there's an interview in which he talks about um, just observing life as it is, just watching time yeah. pass as it is and the slowness of it. And you see this in a lot of Studio Ghibli films where, yeah. you know, there'll be shots of just clouds passing or flowers swaying in the wind, right? Um, and that's that's something that just like really calls out to me because we're living in a world of instant gratification and, and, mm, and yeah. we're constantly bombarded with content that's meant to like grab at your attention. Like just, hey, make sure, like I've worked for agencies, I've worked for clients that are like, hey, make sure there's no moment in this in which the user will, or the, the audience will look away from the phone or, yeah. you know, and I'm just like, man, that's like the opposite of what I want to do. Like yeah. I want, I want somebody to be able to, to like, not only absorb the scene that I'm sort of um, conveying, but also to be able to even pause, take a deep breath and go for a walk themselves. I don't care if they stop midway through my work. Yeah, um, yeah. The practical reason for that being that it's easy. It's, it's, you, <laughs> you just need a tripod and uh, yeah. it's, that's the only way you can really film yourself unless you have a person with you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and you know, thankfully, aesthetically, it's, it's also a good choice often mm. uh, when yeah, it comes to sure. just YouTube videos here and there. Yeah. So then, uh, did you, how did you make this into a career? Because would you call this a career yet? Or would, is it still like trial, trial area for you? Well, I sort of compartmentalize it a little bit. Um, it led to a career, I would say. Um, yeah. But what I do um, for work is slightly different from what I post on YouTube or Instagram. That's just sort of me having fun and having the chance to practice my art in the middle of my projects. Because um, I, I noticed that you're not like, after what the algorithm is doing and you're not doing what YouTube has like, cause you started making videos like five, six years ago and started posting them yeah, on yeah. YouTube and YouTube from like six years ago is not the same YouTube we have now. And so now we have like things like algorithm and thumbnails and blah, 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 like mm -hmm. pin comments and whatnot. And I don't see you chasing that at all because I feel like you're still true to the form and you're like, this is the videos that are coming out of me. These are the videos I'm going to make. Screw the yeah, algorithm. man. Like, right. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm not a great self promoter. I'm not a great marketer. Um, 
I always ask the question, like, why shove this down someone's throat? Like, if they find it, like, you ever find the beauty in, like, finding a piece of music by yourself? And you're just like, wow, this existed, and I didn't know yeah. it. And it's now almost I, like it was I, waiting for it to be founded by you. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's way better than, like, somebody sending a song, be like, please listen to this, please listen to this. Because yeah. now you're sort of, you have that attachment to it, be like, you know, this is, you you see it with the perspective of, yeah, this person wants me to listen to the song. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's just like, a, like, I'm not really the, the type of person that wants people to be on their screens <laughs> and to be online as much yeah. as, you know, it's, it's, it would go against the, the messages I often um, sort of put out there. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't really uh, align with my goals. Like, for, at the end of the day, I just have to think about what is, what do I look like in like 20, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, that's yeah. film director. And being a film director has pretty much almost nothing to do with putting stuff on YouTube or putting yeah. stuff on Instagram that often. Um, along the way, I will have, you know, maybe an interest in uh, making consistent content on online that might go towards a certain goal, but the overall goal, the reason for which I don't push on, on that, you know, marketing side of things, even though I have access to it is because I really have to put my focus in a place that will you know, provide long-term benefit as opposed to something yeah. that will gratify. Um, Cause I always get the, the request, say, please create more, please create. And I wish yeah. I could, I wish I could, but I do have to a earn money and, <laughs> uh, and B uh, make, make things in the more procedural structural way where you have to like write and you have to pitch it and then you have yeah. to get funding and then you have to no, I develop. Think that's a great a way of doing that because you're still liberated, uh, by your own passions and you're not enslaved by you're not making content for the sake of making content yeah and i think going back yeah. to your like your channel while i was preparing for this uh i went down a rabbit hole of all your videos and i think they had incredible rewatch re values and it just feels oh, like you're making content for the sake of making it right just it was yeah it was good yeah. content yeah. i could watch it again and again mm -hmm. You know, I even limit um, my work, like how much access my uh, someone has to my work. Like I'll often take down old posts or old videos just because like I'll, I'll rewatch them and be like, you know, am I still sort of the same person? Am I, yeah. you know, it, it helps to see someone in an older form and, and, you know, pick their mind a little bit and see yeah. how they've evolved over time. But for me, it's really about like, you know, how much time will someone spend on this and how much value are they getting in indirect proportion to that amount of time because for me uh, time is the most valuable commodity we have yeah. um and and i feel like i, I I'll, I'll be personally accountable for everything someone has ab like absorbed and sucked from from my work and uh it's really important that i, I give them the best yeah. it's like a responsibility you have as a creator right like you don't want to waste yeah, someone's yeah, time yeah. And, and you know, not uh, a lot of people think about this responsibility, sadly, because yeah. I'll see stuff that just, you know, it, it, it'll just be very like, it'll just be a beautiful thing in the most surface sense. You know what I'm saying? There's yeah. no depth. Um, and, and to each their own, I feel like uh, for a lot of people, it's just really about being able to express themselves. And uh, but uh, for me personally, it's like everything I have to put out there, um, it, it has to have value. For sure. And it does. And it, the thing is, um, the type of videos you're making, I haven't, you're, like the type of art, really, the word art that you're making is, it's, I haven't seen it before. And the other thing that's really amazing about your work is how you incorporate the stillness that we were talking about with the music. So you intentionally go out and you choose music like Mehdi Hassan, who's like a prolific Pakistani uh, Gawad or Ghazal, Ghazal artist. Yeah. Then you have Ali Sethi in it. And then you yourself are covering music from old time Bollywood or like old Daisy Brown music. Right, right. It's again, the juxtaposition of those things. It's just like, I know that this should not sound as well as it does right now, but I don't know how you make it work. And it's just... It adds to the aesthetic value. Yeah, it adds to the essence of it to the point where I can... When you're walking down those mountains or those hills, I can smell those leaves. I can smell the dirt under your feet. Like it's that intense sometimes when, when the music is complimenting the scene. Yeah, yeah. And so it, I want to know, because we talked about Mayor and we talked about Passenger before on Clubhouse and then we will definitely be talking about him here. 
how did you go about finding your way through the music world? Like, cause it's really easy to go and listen, listen to the pop artist, but then yeah, yeah, yeah. you, and I would, I guess us as well, we go a step further and we're like, you know what? Let her go is a pretty cool song. What else does he have to offer? I don't think a lot right, of people right. go that deep. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then how did you get introduced like Mehdi Hassan and stuff like that? Was it yeah. his parents or was it you actively find them? Yeah. It's interesting. You asked that. Um, I feel like music's always been this one thing that's, the, the non-visual love that I have. Yeah. Uh, but even then, whenever I listen to something or I hear something, the first thing I do is I imagine a scene to it. Yeah. Um, and it's always been, it's actually like how I made my first film ever. Um, and um, yeah, I think I, I'm, I feel deeply, deeply, deeply affected um, by music. My exploration of um, the music I listen now, like really, has a long evolution that traces back to, you know, me coming to Canada. And yeah. um, this was before I owned anything with songs on it. So I think like all of that stuff started after I migrated with my family. Um, I remember being at school and we had music class and we had to do presentations and we had to basically pick a band at that, at that time. I was just listening to whatever. Um, the music wasn't really a focus but it was always something I appreciated. So I started looking into bands and stuff. And I remember like coming across Green Day because they were popular, Simple Plan and all this yeah. stuff. Um, this was stuff I was, you know, into at the time, but um, it, it didn't really emotionally uh, engage me as much as, um, you know, other work did. And so, like, sometimes I'd hear a song in popular culture and it would really move me. And I was 10 at the time. So mm. Like not a lot of like guys were listening to this kind of music. It would be like, you know, something like Hillary Duff or like, you know, <laughs> what's a um, big girls don't cry. And like, I love that song, man. Like, it's not, it's such a, it's such a yeah, banger. Okay. Like, it, yeah, for sure. But, you know, I'd listen to that. I'd be like, man, what a beautiful melody. What a beautiful, you know, arrangement. Mm -hmm. At the time, I wasn't thinking these things. I, at the time, it was just like, wow, this song is great. Right. But now I think I still think back to that. I mean, like the reason I listen to these things, because at the end of the day, I'm just really attracted to like beauty um, yeah. in, in, in its like most pure essence uh, removed from all, you know, material, cultural emphasis that we put on, on this kind of stuff. So for me, it's just like, what do I find beautiful? What do I, I'm not going to make a compromise on, on what's culturally relevant or what's yeah. relevant to me as a man, what's masculine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, it's really just about what do I really enjoy listening to? And at that time, it, if it was Big Girls Don't Cry, it was that. Um, For sure. But yeah, over time at Explore Artists, I got into, you know, um, folk music, acoustic folk, indie. Uh, and then from there, I just started exploring all sorts of genres. And now nowadays, Spotify really helps with that. You know, yeah. every Friday I go through the 30 song list, re release radar to see what any new artists are, you know, and then yeah. discover weekly on Mondays, which is any new music based on what I already listened to. So I'm, I'm yeah. very thorough with it. I love exploring. Yeah. Um, no, you and Osama both have very like thorough playlists. Like wait, for, <laughs> for younger siblings, they get their music taste from their older brothers. But what do you guys do? How do you guys go about exploring That's a good question. new music? And how did you guys get kind of introduced to the artists that you guys are into now? Uh, I think, go for it. Take it. No, no, I think I think I think Osama was for sure um influenced um especially early on by by what I was listening to because yeah. I'd either play it out loud or you know we'd both listen to the things together while he's sitting beside me as I'm playing RuneScape something's playing in the background <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying um but uh like he's developed his own taste in many ways you know it it, it, it evolves um as you go on but um like for me I remember I had like a 3 year cold play phase and, oh yeah you know and, oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know after after that sort of passed on I, I still, I'm still a huge fan of Coldplay but at that time I was only listening to Coldplay Yeah exactly it was um, exactly and, the same I think we had it yeah. at the same time cuz yeah, yeah. we had it like a couple of years before that we went to the show and then a yeah. year after the show yeah, ended much. because we were exactly. like you, you can't my, stop mine it. mine mine started with Milo Zailoto and um, yeah. it was us against the world and I remember it distinctly I, I, I'm very thankful to have a photographic memory because I remember every detail of this day. I was coming home from school. It was, uh, it was like uh, around, around 3 p.m. and the bus driver had dropped off about 70% of the kids. So there was still a few <laughs> left and we we're going back to my neighborhood and the sun, it was a, it was a cold day. 
but it was it's spring was coming. It was about uh, March or April or something. Yeah. And so the snow is melting. The sun is, you know, peering through the windows and you know how it is in the spring. It's cold outside, but like the sun is coming. So it's, you're sort of warmed up and yeah. I'm laying like back on, on my, on my bus seat. And I'm, and I just, I'm exploring through this album and us against the world comes on and okay. I'm just, I'm rocked. Like, that moment in itself, that road, Fountain Road, Cambridge, you know, yeah. I remember everything. And, um, and, I, and, and I've had this sort of experience with so many pieces of new music that I've discovered. Yeah. Ludovico Ainotti, um, what's it, uh, it's called Experience or something. A Divineer uh, was the piece that inspired my first film um, that I actually ended up submitted to, submitting to Mist, which is a Muslim oh, wow. interest this classic yeah. uh, tournament. Yeah. That happens in Toronto and I ended up winning regional and then nationals for that. And that was just based on the, the fact that I was riding a bus one day and yeah. I was listening to the piece and I was imagining, you know, what if uh, there was a homeless person and they found a way through, you know, the help or through inspiration that they, they get from somebody else. They found their way, you know, to climb up the social ladder and, and yeah. became successful. And I was just imagining it to that song. And then we ended up making the film. So it's always been sort of that way. Yeah. Always, it's always a very visual experience. Exactly the same with me. Like when I, when I first wrote my, uh, when I was writing poetry, I was listening yeah. to a lot of music. And yeah, I was yeah. listening to a lot of Snow Patrol and Passenger and Coldplay yeah, yeah. and Oasis and all of these things. And which is really funny because there were a lot of like British bands. Mm. And I was like, I don't know why the UK always makes amazing music. Like you can go from the Beatles to like yeah, all the way down yeah, to like Coldplay. Sure. They just have this for weird sure. thing on art that US and Canada don't. And then I would listen to them. And then like he would say, like Snow Patrol would say something like signal fire is a song to have. And I would just be like, okay, that's a weird word. And my mind would just start like, like a rotary machine to start moving and moving. Yeah, and yeah. It, it would take me places. I wouldn't even know to go like, you know, and, and that's exactly how I finished my poetry book. I was like, these are all inspired by songs that I was listening to at the time, how I was feeling at the time. And like you said, like as the music would come, it would be a visual representation in my head. And yeah, all I had yeah. to do was this, like put it on the paper. And yeah, man. That's I'm glad know. you said that because I felt like I was alone in that, but now I, I don't feel so weird. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that the, the experiences we feel like we were the most alone in are the ones that are shared by everyone, but just yeah. go unspoken. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, that's the case with a lot of people, man. And then your influences are very evident in like your work, like, like you said. And so you, how did you get into the Pakistani music side of it? Like, again, Mehdi Hassan isn't someone that we just like listen to on the yeah, radio. Yeah, He's not yeah, Atif, yeah. right? You won't find him on Discover Weekly. <laughs> yeah, you won't yeah, find no. him on Discover Weekly. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, uh, for me, I mean, it starts, it roots itself back to Pakistan. My first yeah. 10 years, um, you know, there was a lot of exposure to different kinds of music. We had like yeah. Abrar al Haq and yeah. we had, uh, Ali Zafar and those guys at the time. I remember even the the plane ride from uh, from Islamabad to Toronto. I was listening to Channo. Uh, yeah, Channo Ki yeah, by yeah. Ali Zafar. Over <laughs> yeah. and over and over again. I remember distinctly, I left the seat with my parent, like beside my parents, and I went yeah. to an empty seat across uh, the aisles on the other side of the plane. And there was an open window. There was nobody sitting there. So I sat there, I plugged in my Air Canada earphones. I opened the window and I'm watching, <laughs> I'm watching clouds pass by, listening to Chenno, bro. It's such a moment. It's such a, yeah. you know, vivid moment in my life. And, and it's always been like that. Like um, w w when I was going, when we used to go and take trips to Nathia Gali, Murray. Yeah. Um, I just said Beautiful that like place. such a, such a Western guy, Murray. But Murray. Murray. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, like my, my dad had all these like old is gold volume three CDs, you mm -hmm, know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, yep. and it had all the old Bollywood songs that had Noor Jahan and all this stuff. So um, I think for me, when it comes to exploring Pakistani music, there's a heavy, heavy nostalgic side to it. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like I'm, you know, re-exploring my, my culture uh, that I felt so disconnected from that in, in that period um, when I didn't really pay attention to it after migrating and uh, when we were sort of, sort of focused on assimilating sadly yeah, um, yeah. and uh, a lot of we lose a lot yeah. of ourselves when we do that and only in recent years has like thing have things like identity and then you know uh, your your culture and your roots to your culture they're now being popularized and and yeah. i feel like these are the things that a lot of kids in the diaspora are sort of exploring again yeah. thankfully and for me uh, you know 
I, I'm lucky. I'm privileged to have that root in, yeah. in my my you know native language and uh, also your brother was talking about it. Like he was eight when he moved to Canada, and so he was so focused on integrating with the system here and learning the English language that yeah. part of him lost that command over the Urdu language, which I think was a bit sad to hear. But the, yeah, I think it 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 really heavily yeah, depends absolutely. on like what age you are when you leave. Um, at least when it comes to migrating. So so I was ten. I had a you know, uh, I was pretty fluent in Urdu, um, yeah. and and thankfully it never left me. There there are times I remember when I sort of it, it became kachi, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and these are the times that I was not really paying attention to, but I came back uh, because you know I interacted with my parents in Urdu and and I went abroad, uh, went back to Pakistan a couple of times. For Sama and Shazal, they were much younger than me, so um, you know Sama did a very decent job gripping onto that but i remember like there were times where he'd struggle to find the right word or something like yeah that. but um yeah it's really about your exposure when we're when you're living in a five family five person family unit in, in a completely new world and all your focus is on fitting into this new world um you tend to put that in the back seat um, yeah. and you can't really yeah. blame anybody for that it's a very difficult experience yeah for us, I feel lucky because uh, we were in the States for when we were from like from 2004 to 2000, no, sorry, 2001 to 2004, we were in the States and then we moved to Karachi. And then yeah, all yeah. my entire, like from nine years old to 16 years old, I was in Karachi. So I have that like really deep Karachi love. And then when we moved to, like we moved to Pickering, which is a dead town, like there's nothing yeah. happening here. <laughs> we moved from Karachi for a few to Pickering, like- Pickering, <laughs> Ajax, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> happening here, right? At all. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, I would find myself going back to those Atif Aslam records and those Jal records and like things yeah, that yeah. are so not Pickering. <laughs> oh man, Atif Aslam. Oh my God. When Adat came out, man, that was like, oh, the, yeah. that was around the same time. That was on everybody's playlist. Mm. That was on, and we, we even went to a couple of Atif Aslam concerts and these were my first experiences with, with concerts in Canada yeah. is that, is that my parents wanted to do something for like 14 August, you know, Independence Day. Yeah. And there was always like this Markham Fairgrounds, you know, yep. Mela going on. <laughs> and Atif Aslam would show up and, you know, like two hours late, but you'd still yep. get to hear all the all the jams. So, yeah, vivid. That's man. exactly what it was. So we feel, I feel lucky to have both of those. So like I can appreciate an Atif Aslam track really well as opposed, and I appreciate a Coldplay tune. Like it's just, Yeah, yeah. And at the like, same time, like, I, I feel like you're you're not just, oh, sorry. You're not just appreciating like just music but also the different facets of music, mm, like yeah. South Asian music is so different, man. It's so different yeah. from Western music. And what, what what Western music can do with, you know, very basic melodies and tunes and, and you know, different kinds of inter- instrumentation is also very unique. Yeah. And the roots that classical music has in contemporary South Asian music is a world apart as well. I was listening to, uh, I recently got a Jeff Buckley yeah, and yeah. I was just getting into his story and what happened him, to him. And him and Nusrat, yeah. He's my Elvis. He said that I literally got me, gave me goosebumps because I wasn't expecting it. And I was just trying to listen to what, what is he doing about that? And I was like, okay. And then and then I heard Eddie Vedder talk about it. Eddie Vedder yeah, did a song yeah. with Nusrat. Right. And I'm like, these people appreciate the Bro, diversity of music. They idolized. And it's made them, yeah, yeah. literally, right? And it's made them better artists because of it. Like, I love Eddie Vedder's solo stuff. Like, Pearl Jam is Pearl Jam, but Eddie Vedder's solo stuff, it's reflected, his influences are very like evident when he, when you listen to yeah. his stuff. And I was really proud in that moment. I was like, whoa, I guess again, you can call that like a colonial hangover, I need validation from the white man, whatever. But it yeah. was just nice to see greatness appreciate greatness, you know, in that moment. And- yeah, I mean, I feel like there, there are, you know, the, the colonial hangover situation is definitely accurate, but yeah. I feel like when it, when it comes to art, there's definitely, there can be people and artists with pure intentions. And I feel like sometimes art reaches to people in such a way that they forget everything about the Orient and, and, yep. and the otherization of a, a particular community. And they're just like, you know what, this is real. This is really, really beautiful. And to me, like when I listen to Hulk Hulk, you know, Jeff Buckley singing, I'm just like, man, this guy really, really appreciated Nusrat, yep. man. This is, yeah. this is on another level. Yeah. Uh, and to then be able it to makes shout him just- out like that. Yeah, like on live on stage and he just goes into this like, like I don't think it was rehearsed or anything. It just goes into it, right? And it made me sad to see what happened to Jeff Buckley. Like, I mean, obviously it was yeah. very tragic.
But then yeah. reflecting back, all of his songs have like this new like filter on it now. Like it's like, this is it, man. This is all the Jeff Buckley you get. Cherish it. And that's the same I feel about like Nusup when I listen to his old yeah. Cavalli's. I'm like, this is it. Yeah, oh. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, th- I think for me, that's, that's the same with Medias. And I'm, I'm a big yeah. Ghazal fan. So yeah. Medias and, you know, all those guys. Yeah, man. Yeah, rest in peace. Um, so the other interesting thing about you as we more dive deep into your life is that you married out of the Pakistani circle. <laughs> this is huge. I did, almost I did, yeah, yeah. No, I am. Yeah. No, this is huge. <laughs> I get mad at him. No, I'm oh, not damn. mad at him. I, I 100% like I second that so much. I feel like and he's about to go like, <laughs> I was like oh, why damn. did you do that? Why? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was your relationship with your wife is so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, oh, thanks, it's genuinely beautiful. Like it's, Thank you, it's romantic. It's pretty. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's just the, the, when you like, there's a moment in your most recent short film or I call them short films. I don't call them vlogs because they're not vlogs. They're short films. <laughs> and there's a moment where you put your head on her chest and you're like, I don't feel so good. Yeah, and that is yeah, yeah. such a raw moment. That, that, that moved me yeah, so yeah. much. Just that, just that honesty. And you kept it in the shot and you kept it in the film. And I just, I, I'm going to get emotional, but it was, it moved me a lot. And I, I just want to know if you're, if you're comfortable in telling how you met your wife and how that relationship progressed and was it difficult in your family to be like, okay, are you marrying outside really? Or was it just easy going like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I met her on the greatest matchmaking dating site of all time instagram <laughs> um, um no it we works. just we just started talking man like um for me um I'd, I'd i'd been following her for i don't know how many years before yeah. we actually started talking and uh, yeah it's never you know it's for me it's never really about like just the initial attraction that you have to a person i think um a relationship ha- it needs to have its foundation much much beyond that and yeah uh, when we started talking, you know, it started with something as simple as music, <laughs> as always. Um, but then we started, you know, getting into conversations about culture and politics and different things here and there. And and through those conversations, I really began to sort of draw a picture of the kind of values she has. Yeah. And when you start to sort of understand a person's value system, you're really understanding a, a very core part of that person. And, yeah. and to know that... Um, and then to also know that those values for the most part aligned with mine. Um, yeah. I was just like, you that's know what, like, let's, let, like if we're going to carry on talking, let's, let's keep the intentions clear. So uh, I just straight up told her like, you know, Hey, like, would you be you know interested in pursuing something more serious? Because, you know, I feel like you're a person that I can really, you know, for the lack of a better word, vibe with. Yeah, um, and imagine from there, that text. That's daunting. That's so harrowing. Man. No, not at all. And I think I think that's really? the beautiful, the most beautiful thing about it is just like there was no nervousness in the beginning. Um, I don't. I can't speak for her, but for me, like it just seems very, very natural. Which, which is why um, it felt so unique. Um, yeah, and I felt so sort of obliged to do that because you know I've known a lot of people in my life, um, had a lot of friendships, and. Um, I I really am very selective with with the company I want to keep around me. Um, And it just goes back to, you know, the idea that, you know, your friends influence who you are very, very deeply. Uh, And I've seen this with a lot of people around me. Um, And, and, and I've not really met people like her very often. And anytime I have, I've made sure they stay, they stay close. Um, Yeah. So yeah, it, for me, it was just like, yeah, you know, I've, I've gotten to know her a bit better. Let's continue this. And um, hopefully at some point we can be like, all right. So how do you, how do you do translate it. those feelings to parents, especially Daisy Brown parents, which they don't really, man, I understand. feel like, I feel like there's a huge, um, I think I, I, I find myself lucky and privileged to be able to say this, even as part of a South Asian family, Yeah. not that my parents are easygoing. My mom is very easygoing. My mom's like yeah. my best friend, man. Uh, but when it comes to my dad, um, after a certain point, I think like after age 16, 17, I had more of a, I was a bit more vocal with, with, yeah. you know, what I stand for and the kind of values that I have, um, as even when they were in contrast, um, yeah. especially if they were in contrast with his, um, so like he sort of began to gather an idea 
of me in his head as well. So it, the imposition uh, when brown dads or, you know, any sort of, um, when they start to impose their own values on their kids, yeah, you know, before that started happening, I, I, I began to sort of stand up and be like, you know what, listen, I appreciate you. And you have to do it in such a balanced way. You can't be like, yeah. no, I don't want to listen to you. It has to yeah, be like, you can't hey, be disrespectful, respect, which is yeah, a very exactly. different thing from being, and uh, having yeah, opposing views. And, and that's the thing is that like in our culture, opposing viewpoints or different viewpoints are often synonymous with disrespect, disrespect which yeah. is not true. Right. No, you no. can, you can tell your parents, Hey, like, yeah, but I believe it in doing things this way. Yeah. but still love them and be respectful to them yep. according to, you know, your religious values or your cultural values. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. So yep. yeah, from a, from, from a, I think I started, you know, rooting myself in that position. And, and when I, when it came to it, you know, 10, nine, eight years later, I was just like, Hey, let me, you know, let me do this. Um, yeah. And I, I'm still very blessed that, like, I, I can't, I can't believe I didn't get any friction. You know, I, I would wow, I expect a conversation that, at least. That, yeah. That's like a big uh, mashallah moment, bro. That's and honestly. I think that was, that was this thing that told me, all right, God wants us to, yeah. <laughs> you know, all right. Cause you always got to know, you know, know that God exactly. wants this too. <laughs> exactly. Cause like, you know, if, if there's an issue or anything, I would love, love to have had more discussion than, you know, yeah. make sure they're completely on board before I make the decision. But yeah, it was, yeah. It was, yeah, I have a strong foothold, alhamdulillah, uh, when it comes to have, having discussions and conversations yeah. with, with my parents. And on that note, actually, I would love to sort of put this out there. Like, if you want to, if you want to really have your parents take you seriously, make sure you start putting yourself in that position early on uh, yeah. and make sure you you have discussions in a very composed way. And I, lo I know a lot of the times it can be met with anger uh, and mm -hmm. frustration, but I think as long as you contain contain your own self and your ego and your pride uh, and remain respectful. You can yeah. be consistent and, and have that perception of you in their minds change over time. And that's yeah. the most valuable things that, that it takes years, man. It's not like mm -hmm. one day you can be like, all right, dad, I'm a, I'm a do this now. And you have to respect that. You can't, it, ha it takes years to really have them change their opinion of you that, Hey, you're not just my child anymore. Like I don't yeah. own you. I don't, I can't impose my worldview on you. You're, you're from a different time, but yeah, you're still my kid and you're going to, you're going to pursue your life in a, in a very good and balanced and uh, in a way that you know best. I think sometimes the reason why brown dads get kind of offended when we do question, not question, but differ from their values is because their values is all that they know. Their values are part of their identity. Yeah, so if we kind of question or disagree with their values. It's kind of like, you know, they don't know what to fall back on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, also because, um, you know, we, we come from a very different culture in, in that, in that our social structures back in Pakistan or back in, even in, in our communities in the West are yeah. very community based, community oriented. Whereas the Western ideal is, is to be an individualist, you know, to yeah. really think about yourself and think about your, uh, how you will prosper as on a personal level. Yeah. Whereas, um, you know, the East as, as if you want to call it that, um, they're, they're often dependent on, you know, so yeah. it, it, it goes to a fault, sadly. Uh, but not, not that that community oriented way of life is, is a bad, I think there is a beautiful balanced way of living that yes, and being individualistic at the same time. So, um, there needs to be consideration of that in these matters for sure. I am. I love it. Like I, I love this entire conversation. I'm so I'm so glad you said yes. And I'm so glad you're here. And this Amazing. conversation literally moved me and it Man, inspired me. Pleasure. And I hope it inspires everyone who listens to this because this is just, you're one of those, I see you becoming one of the most prominent voices in our culture and in our, in, our, in our community. And inshallah, it'll happen soon. And it'll happen quick. And uh, I can't wait to see where you go from here because literally kind of you, all you can do is go up. I, we I hope I can like more work that you have that to, to put out there. We're like, not to be one of those people, but we wish to see more people work from you. Like whenever you can do that responsibility justice, man, that's the, it's, I feel like as uh, the more influence that you have, the more sort of, um, the more out there you get, uh, the more responsibility that falls on you. And, you know, oftentimes our culture, especially the social media culture is all, yeah. almost waiting for you to make a mistake or something, but they are. I hope yeah. I can always, uh, always do it justice um in that that 
regardless of what I, what, what, what personal decisions I may make, um, everything I put out there is for the benefit of the community and bro, for, yeah. Amen, for everything bro. I say. Amen. For and lots of love to you. Lots of love to your beautiful wife. And I, we hope to see more content like that. And we just keep, keep going, brother. Yeah. Keep going. You have, you have our love. Thank you so much. How are you? All right. Take care, man. Wa alaikum salam.